Good evening, listeners. You're tuned into the Ghostly Broadcast, Paranormal Station. I'm your host, Timothy. Broadcasting the testimonies of others who have encountered the supernatural parts of our world as they brushed up against the veil and void. Lighthouses have existed for as long as sailors have been on the seas, alerting ships of rocks and dangerous waters as they approach their destinations. We travel to Asia tonight to hear the testimonies from people who have seen how influential these beacons of light have been on the paranormal plane. Our first testimony of the night comes from Dia in West Bengal. Dear Timothy, I'm Dia. I want to tell you a story that my grandmother told me. She was only a little girl then, but said she could never forget what she saw. Not one moment of it. My grandmother lost everyone during the famine in 1943. Her father had left the family to find work. The British had taken all the food, and there was no money to buy any. He had no choice but to leave for Calcutta to try and find work. Her mother and siblings didn't last much longer after that. One by one, they were taken by starvation and diseases. Orphaned and alone, my poor grandmother was left to fend for herself as the countryside withered away. One day, a ship was spotted coming into port. A crowd had gathered at a lighthouse to get advantage of all the commotion. Getting close to the port was impossible. Soldiers had blocked the whole place off to prevent anyone from stealing goods. The lighthouse was also manned by British soldiers. My grandmother always said it didn't matter that they looked like them and spoke the same language. They became British when they wore that uniform. Are they bringing food? The people in the crowd cried out loud, my grandmother explained. The few soldiers who were standing guard wouldn't respond. They just told everyone to go home. But no one had homes left to go to. The countryside was in ruins. Denialist policies of the Second World War prevented food from being imported and all the food grown was taken to feed soldiers and factory workers. The people of the countryside were starving and desperate. Some had even resorted to cannibalism. It was a grim time to be alive. As the crowd became increasingly riled up, the sky clapped with thunder. Everyone fell silent as the sudden boom from the heavens caused everyone to pause. My grandmother looked up towards the sky. Suddenly, a boom accompanied by a snapping fork of lightning struck the lighthouse. Its light shone brighter than the sun as it burst into flames. Brick and mortar tumbled to the ground as lightning struck again and again. My grandmother said that she, the crowd and the soldiers stared right into the flaming eye of Shiva, angered and cursing at the needless blight wrought onto the land. The soldiers dropped their weapons and ran. They threw their jackets and uniforms to the floor as they did as if to shed their own complicity like a snake sheds its skin. But Shiva does not forget, my grandmother always said. The crowd of skinny, bony people stood in awe of the bright, burning light. Some fell to their knees in worship. Others were too weak for even that. Today, the ruined tower stands as a reminder of our history, of the dark days we've left in our past, and a legacy of the evil done to our people by occupying armies. Thank you, Dia. Thank you, Dia, for recounting your grandmother's testimony. In my own research, it seems that the gods of any culture are as real as the people that worship them. Faith is a thing that one cannot examine and understand. It is as intangible as the paranormal. Our next testimony is from Arav in India. Dear Timothy, My name is Aurav. I'm a simple maintenance technician. 
It's a fancy way of saying that I change light bulbs for a living, whether they're big or small. My job has taken me to a few interesting places, but the best one by far has to be Dolphin's Nose Lighthouse. It overlooks the city of Visakhapatnam and all its docks, the naval yard and the vast blue ocean. I'd been called out to investigate some faulty wiring in the middle of the night. It was an emergency job because whatever had gone wrong prevented the light from working. Ships had already been forewarned, so I had to get it working again as soon as possible. Seeing the lighthouse unlit at night gave the place an unsettling look. Usually the light can be seen for miles and the surrounding area below its dolphin nose would be bathed in its light. In darkness, it was just a black tower standing menacingly. The whole experience was made worse by its isolation. These things aren't manned anymore. They don't need to be when you can push a button from miles away to turn the light on or off. I made my way inside and headed for the fuse box to investigate. I don't know why, but the place felt cold. The silence inside it echoed my footsteps, but they sounded muffled, like I was listening underwater. The hairs on my body stood up as I felt a chill. The night air blew in through the door behind me and slammed it shut. I jumped out of my skin and fumbled in the dark for my torch. The door was locked automatically. I wasn't going anywhere unless I could get the power back on. With no other way to go, I ventured further in to find the fuse box. When I found it, I saw the problem immediately. Fuse had definitely gone, but it had burned out spectacularly. The whole box had been charred. I had enough spares to finish the job, but as I worked away, I heard something. It sounded like the groaning of metal under pressure. Like a ship's hull at sea, straining against the tide. It was loud and unmistakable. I turned my head this way and that, trying to see the source of the noise. My torchlight scanned backwards and forwards across the empty room. There was nothing at first, but then I noticed something. It looked like a naval uniform, but it wasn't an Indian naval uniform. This one was different. I squinted and focused my torch on it. It was definitely a uniform, and someone was standing in it. An aged old captain, and he was staring right at me. A loud explosion sounded, and I yelped back in surprise, dropping my torch. In the darkness, I heard muffled, wet footsteps coming towards me. Slowly, the captain was coming for me. I scrambled at the fuse box, flicking every breaker until the lights flashed on, and I heard the motor for the main bulb starting to turn. The room lit up, and I was alone. I hurried out of the lighthouse, hoping I'd just imagined the specter I'd seen. When I walked out into the night, now bathed in the rotating beams of the lighthouse, I saw something I'll never forget in the bay. The light swept over like a radar display, lighting the bay with each periodic pass. I saw a submarine with a Pakistani flag floating on the surface. Its crew glowed translucently on its deck. They were all standing to attention, staring up at the lighthouse. Disappearing each time, the light left them. One more pass of the light, and they were gone, leaving nothing but calm, slack water shimmering in the beams of passing light. It had to be them the Ghazi. The submarine disappeared during the war in the 80s. Was the lighthouse their beacon to the afterlife? Did it reveal what happened to them, Timothy? I know these paranormal sightings are your area of expertise. Me? I'm just a technician. Yours, Arav. Thank you for your testimony, Arav. Sailors have used lighthouses to protect them from danger and guide them into safe harbors. No matter how they died or what flag their vessel flew, 
they all share the same depths in death. Our next testimony comes from David, a sailor of the Pacific. Dear Timothy, I'm David, and I've lived the nomadic, seafaring lifestyle since I learned to sail. I never wanted the nine to five, so I contented myself with a life of self-reliant adventure. I've been all over the tropics and sailed to all Pacific corners in my little boat. There are so many tiny islands where you can stop for however long you want without anyone stopping you. It is truly paradise. I found plenty of places with rich history, one of which is pretty well known. On Puluat Atoll, there's an old World War II Japanese military base. It has bunkers, a shipwreck, and even an old lighthouse they built. It was definitely on my list to see. I anchored just off the beach and swam to shore with a dry bag full of my camping gear. I wanted to spend a night or two camping, exploring the place, taking photos, and drawing sketches. I remember being disappointed by it at first. The bunkers and lighthouse had been covered in graffiti and left to ruin. I guess when there is no one around to stop it, it's to be expected. The island itself, though, was an unspoiled paradise. I did my exploring, and when a rainstorm came in in the evening, I figured why not take shelter in the lighthouse. So I set up my sleeping stuff and settled in for the night. As the storm raged on, the claps of thunder started to feel closer. They shook the air, and the waves of booming sound hit me right in my chest. In the dark, pouring rain, I sat in the gloomy concrete, unable to sleep. An explosion burst over my head, and I felt dust and rocks falling on top of me. I heard men shouting and screaming. Some were saying words in Japanese. Others were crying out in pain. There was no one else around, as far as I could tell Timothy, but I clambered out of the lighthouse to see what was happening. Making out the figures in the dark was hard, but I saw silhouettes of men in uniforms scrambling about the beach. I heard the roar of plane engines, the rhythmic thud of anti-aircraft fire. I looked at the soldiers running around in the dark. As the lightning flashed again, I saw them for what they truly were, dead men. Illuminated in the light were faceless, forgotten figures. Their heads had no eyes, nose, or mouth, no features at all. Like mannequins moving, I couldn't tell them apart. I felt a hand on my shoulder and jolted out of my skin. I turned to face the person who had grabbed me. Another faceless man in a Japanese uniform was standing in front of me. A pair of glasses hung where the eyes should have been. I struck out with my hand, slapping at its featureless face. I fell backwards, and the world became a formless, black void. When I woke up, the storm had passed, and I could feel the tropical sun's light shining on my face. I held my hand against the dried blood on my head and felt the sore ache of the injury that had knocked me unconscious. I felt something clutched in my other hand. When I opened my first to inspect it, I saw a pair of old, rounded, broken glasses. The same I'd seen on the faceless man last night. Yours sincerely, David. Thank you for your testimony, David. Warfare is one of the worst of all the human tragedies that stain our natural and supernatural planes. It is random, chaotic killing and needless waste of human life. Safe travels, David. Our next testimony comes from Xi in Macau, China. Dear Timothy, I'd never considered myself religious. I wouldn't even go as far as to say I'm spiritual or a believer in spirits, but I can't deny what I saw with my own eyes. It's been decades, but I still remember it vividly. I was in my teens and some friends, and I had been fooling around in Gia Hill Park. 
It was late, and we should have been heading home, but we had too much fun in our little hangout after dark. The park is supposed to be closed at night, but we knew ways of getting around it without being noticed. It wasn't like we were vandalizing the place, so we were probably left alone. We hung around the children's play area, laughing and joking when someone heard a cracking in the bushes. Snapping twigs and crunching leaves stunned us into silence. We all stared into the darkness, trying to see what it was. Some of us whispered to each other, wandering out loud. Then, the bushes and branches parted. Two huge paws reached out, and the giant figure pulled itself through. A massive jaw of enormous fangs emerged in a snarling growl from the foliage. The thing revealed itself. It was neither a man nor a beast. It was both. It had four arms, four legs, a giant maned head, and huge paws. It had the yellow eyes of a tiger, and they were staring right at us with ferocious hunger. We ran, scattering in all directions. I sprinted through the park's winding pathways, losing track of where I'd been or where I was even going. Anywhere to get away from that thing. But it was right on me. I'd lost my friends, and now it was just me frantically running for my life. I headed up the hill towards the old Gaia fortress. I reached the top of the hill, and the gate to the fortress was closed. I could see the old lighthouse tower behind the thick walls, but there was nowhere to go. I choked on flame as I tried to catch my breath, coughing my lungs up as I did. I heard the pounding footsteps of the giant, lumbering beast. It had me, and there was nothing that I could do. I cried out and begged to be spared, but it didn't relent. The demonic being just carried on its slow march towards me. The beast paused a few more steps from me. The gates behind me swung open, and blinding light shone through it. The creature wailed and recoiled, shielding its eyes with its vast arms. I ran through the gates and saw the lighthouse begin beaming out light. I ran towards it, and I heard the gates shut behind me. The creature roared, but I didn't look back. The fortress staff found me the following day. They assumed I'd gotten lost and locked in when they closed up. That's the story I went with when my parents confronted me about it. It wasn't like I could tell them the truth. That thing, whatever it was, it was unnatural. But something else saved me, Timothy. Something equally as abnormal and not of this world. As an older man, I still haven't figured out just what any of it was or what it all meant. Perhaps you or your listeners may know the truth of it. Kind regards, She. Thank you for your testimony, She. A lighthouse's primary function is to bring light to darkness, to chase away its shadows and beam in salvation. It would appear that you were granted such salvation that night. This concludes the evening's ghostly broadcast of Paranormal Station. I hope that wherever you are, listeners, a light guides your path and keeps you safe from all that creeps in darkness. If you enjoyed this broadcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and tapping the bell icon. It significantly supports our work to document, catalog, and collect testimonies from around the globe. I've been your host, Timothy. My farm beckons me and I look forward to joining you for the next broadcast, dear listeners. Take care.